place is beautiful even when it's raining. It's kind of hypnotic to watch the pond and the, and the raindrops. Please stand and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance first off. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Speaker. Yeah. I think our technical. <laughs> our Zoomers did not see the flag, but now they can. Sorry about that. And welcome, Zoomers, too, by the way. Uh, we do have a few guests. And I'm going to call on uh, Grace, if you'll introduce our guest, although Carla's been here before, but we still like to do an introduction. And David Beck is hosting a guest, who, who you'll recognize if you're here on April 15th, I think it was, but anyway. It's in. <laughs> welcome, Michael. Welcome, Carla. I hate to uh, start announcements on a sad note, but Yana Ross, uh, our member, lost her mother, I think, maybe just yesterday. She's been battling cancer. And more somewhat somber news, there's some cards going around. And uh, some of you know, but Mike Worswick has been diagnosed mm -hmm. with ALS and uh, is struggling with that. And I got an email, it was just yesterday, so I didn't get a chance to include it in my weekly email, but Jim Ogle uh, emailed me and offered to help with the, uh, be on the Zoom team. But he said it might be a little while before he can attend. And he's actually battling two forms of cancer. So, but in his email, he said, I, I asked him, is Jim, is it okay if I announce this? And he was a little bit reluctant, but he says, I believe in the power of prayer. And if people know, they can pray. So anyway, uh, on a better note. Please look in your spam folders weekly. You're going to get an email from me and you're going to get an email from Marie for the invitation. And it's hit and miss on which folder it's going to end up. And if you don't get anything at all, try and remember to reach out to Marie if you plan to attend because we need to get the head count. Uh, let's see. Uh, volunteer hours. Please report those to Jeanette Weens, and I had her email address in my email yesterday. And volunteer hours, it doesn't have to be specifically a Rotary project. Church-related, civic organizations, you're sitting on a nonprofit board, those types of things, we would like to capture those hours because we do report that to Rotary International. Um, I announced last week, it's been in the emails, I still am welcoming feedback. We are considering in the July through September timeframe, and we'll probably decide in the board meeting coming up in a few weeks, we may go to two in-person meetings per month, still having four per month, but two will be in-person and Zoom, and then two would be Zoom only. Uh, but I am seeing a little more attendance uh, even today versus a couple of weeks ago. So I think some of the COVID hesitancy is maybe going away and we'll get our numbers up. I mentioned earlier, the Zoom team, we would like to have some people help. Uh, Steve and Marie is also kind of our Zoom expert, but uh, we're not asking you to take over the responsibility. We are asking that maybe you can uh, help them out a little bit. Couple of save the dates, wine tasting at Steve and Sally Knowles, uh, May 25th, is that a Tuesday? Tuesday? Tuesday, May 25th, 6 to 7.30, if I remember correctly. And an invitation already went out. Steve sent an invitation last Tuesday, again, look in your spam folder if you didn't get it. 
Uh, mentioned it many times that team training is going on in Lawrence. Lots of fun, half day commitment. This is last call for RILA. We do have one RILA application. I keep hearing that we may have a few more, but we are running out of time to get those in. And I will need to sub submit those to the district here pretty soon. I think that is it for my announcements. And normally I don't like to read something from the podium, but I'm gonna read this one because it does give you some background information about our speaker to, um, so you'll understand why she's doing what she's doing. Uh, Don Bueller is the Kansas Riverkeeper. That is actually a position and executive director of the Friends of the Caw. She can be reached at riverkeeper at kansasriver.org. In addition to managing the daily activities of the Friends of the Caw, she monitors, responds, and mediates suspected pollution incidents to the Kansas River, facilitates educational paddle trips, manages uh, advocacy efforts to protect and preserve the Kansas River. Growing up on a farm in the plains of Kansas, Don knew at a young age how much he loved the land, water, and nature. Don was born and raised in the Caw River Valley in DeSoto on a 2,000 acre crop farm. The family farm ran along the Kansas River in DeSoto. She spent her childhood riding <clears throat> alongside her father, learning about the importance of taking care of soil, water, and providing for the family. She also spent many hours on the beautiful Kansas River, fishing, camping, canoeing, and riding in her dad's airboat. Her love for the river began at this early age when she would sit and watch the sunset on the river at the front of each farm, at the end of each farm day. Dawn continued to help on the farm and also went to college after high school. She earned a Bachelor of Science in nat Natural Resources, Fish, and Wildlife Conservation. That was from Oregon State University. She also has a Bachelor uh, in Business Administration from Baker. Dawn has spent her career working as a conservationist, accountant, and farmer. Dawn's passions is, passion is watershed management and finding ways to, we can all work together to improve our watershed and the quality of the Kansas River. As a native Kansan, Dawn has a vested interest and passion for the river. Dawn is happiest when she is outdoors. You can often find her fishing, hiking, kayaking, reading, and exploring. Dawn lives with her family, including two chocolate Labrador retrievers on her farm south of Eudora. Please welcome Dawn. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good to be here. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be in Topeka. This is actually my third day in a row driving to Topeka. Uh, Tuesday, uh, I was up here for the, I'm chair of the Kansas Water Authority. I just got appointed by Governor Laura Kelly uh, in um, January and confirmed by the Senate in February. So I've been on the job about 60 days and had a, a meeting up here in Topeka. And then yesterday I had the Topeka Riverfront Advisory Council, which I'm on that. And so I was here yesterday talking about the river. And then I'm here today with you folks. So I probably should move here, right? <laughs> um, so thank you for having me. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about um, Friends of the Caw and what we do and about the Kansas River Water Trail. So there's a lot of different things that we do but um, I'm gonna focus on a couple of things that are probably um, most um, relatable to Topeka. So this is a picture of the Kansas River. This was taken last year. Uh, we did an event called the Call 173. I kayaked the entire Kansas River, all 173 miles with a team. There were seven of us and it took us nine days. And we stopped in every city along the way. And our goal was to showcase that you can use the Kansas River Water Trail and stop at these communities and interact, right? So we stopped at Call River State Park and we were supposed to meet Governor Kelly and uh, she ended up having to deal with some COVID stuff. We understood, so uh, her husband, Dr. Ted Dottie came with us along with Brad Loveless, Secretary of Wildlife Parks and Tourism. And they went with us from Call River State Park to the Topeka Weir 
And there we had uh, folks from the city of Topeka come and talk about the weir modifications that were going to happen. But we had burritos delivered to the boat ramp, big burritos from here in Topeka. Um, and we did this all the way down the river. We had, frankly, we ate our way down the river. <laughs> we, we all thought that we probably gained a lot of weight um, during that trip because every single time we stopped, somebody brought us food. And so it was a really great trip. But this was a shot, this is around Eudora um, when the sun was setting on the Kansas River. So I'm gonna first talk about who we are and what we do. And then I'll talk about the Kansas River Water Trail because there's a lot of really neat things happening um, along the Kansas River. And it's along the entire 173 mile long corridor. So Friends of the Cause of 501c3, we're a nonprofit. This year we celebrate our 30th year, 30 years of protecting the Kansas River. And um, so our mission basically is to advocate for the rehabilitation of the Kansas River environs, the water quality and the wildlife habitat, but also promote compatible recreational use on the river and to work with all of the communities up and down the river to do that. My job is the Kansas River Keeper. So that is a non-governmental public advocate who holds the community accountable for the health of the Kansas River. So my job in a nutshell is to be the ears, the eyes, the voice of the Kansas River. So when I'm in meetings and we're talking about things that we're gonna do in our communities, my job is to say, okay, let's wait, let's, let's think for a minute, how is this gonna impact our river and um, the watershed and, and the greater picture? So um, that's my job as the Kansas River Keeper. We are a member of the Global uh, Water Keeper Alliance. And that is, so that is a trademarked name, River Keeper. And so we're the only one in the state of Kansas. Um, there's a few in the Midwest, but a lot of river keepers are on the coast. But um, there is one at the Missouri um, confluence in St. Louis. There's a Missouri River Keeper. Um, there's one on the Grand in Oklahoma. Um, one in the Quad Cities. So there's a few um, here in the Midwest. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our programs. So these are um, all the different things that we do that frankly, a lot of people don't know about um, because what we're most known for is our, our educational paddle trips. So you heard uh, my intro, I was born and raised on the Kansas River in DeSoto. So I was lucky, right? I had access to the Kansas River. I don't know where my dad got it, but you know, he was a farmer and he would go get this trailer of canoes. No idea where he got them from. But I mean, it's not like there's canoes floating around Kansas. And so he, we would take them to Eudora because there were only like three or four access points on the Kansas River. And one of them was at Eudora on the Wakarusa. And we would put in there and we would canoe with a whole bunch of families down to our farm and we would get off the river. And we could do that because we had access to private property. Well, the Kansas River is one of only three rivers in the entire state of Kansas that's a public waterway. And so most people had no way to get on their public river. So when Friends of the Call was started 30 years ago, that's the first thing they said, okay, wait a minute, it's a public river, but nobody can access it. So we started building boat ramps. And so a lot of people know us for the boat ramps. Um, Mike Caldwell, rest his soul, who was with Friends of the Call for a long time, he built boat ramps. And so we now have 19 on the Kansas River. But that's probably what most people know us for, but we have several programs. I'm gonna just gonna touch on those briefly. We have an adopt a boat ramp program where we work with local community groups to adopt the local boat ramps, to clean them once a quarter and keep them clean. So we've adopted both the Topeka Weir and the Call River State Park boat ramp. We have not um, adopted the Seward ramp. So if anyone's interested or knows anyone that would be interested, um, that one still needs to be adopted. Um, our educational paddle trip program is probably what most people know that we do. We take the public and high school and, and college science classes out and we use the Kansas River as a classroom. So we take um, students out and we'll do water quality testing. Um, some of the uh, professors that we work with, they use the Kansas River to take geology class, classes out. So they'll take sediment samples out of sandbars and show the different layers and help the students understand about sediment transport within a river system. So we, um, 
to work with teachers to figure out in what ways they want to use the Kansas River as a classroom. We have an ecosystem restoration program where we um, remove native or remove invasive species and plant native plants to protect water quality. We have a big grant that we're waiting to hear back on that if we win, it'll be our first ecosystem restoration project in Topeka. We partnered with the city of Topeka, uh, Department of Utilities and the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism to do one of these projects at Call River State Park. If you've ever been there, there's a huge hill that you come down to get to the river. And so there's a lot of flashiness that occurs. And so we're gonna do some work there with wildlife and parks and the city to um, use it as an educational opportunity to teach the public about how these things can benefit the river. So fingers crossed on that one. Uh, we do have a Kids About Water program, which is our um, program in grades six through 12. We actually do a whole week long program with science teachers in the classroom and we take kids stream side. So we find the stream that's closest to their school and we take them down and we put have stations and they will um, save for macro invertebrates, which are indicators of good or bad water quality. They'll test for pH and conductivity and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, but we'll teach them how to do these things. And they'll actually take the data. Um, they'll write it on a clipboard, just like you would if you were working in the field and they'll take it back to the classroom and they'll analyze the data. And so they can learn something about their local waterway based upon that program. Probably the other really big thing we do, we're the only one that does it, we clean up the Kansas River. And I'm not just talking about plastic water bottles. We do clean those up, but we clean up the legacy sites. Last fall, we cleaned up 456 tires that were embedded in a sandbar in the middle of the Kansas River. It was in the middle. So we had to take people out there and we had to bring boats out. And we had three uh, flat bottom John boats that hauled. My husband, bless his heart, he does a lot of volunteering. He drove the Friends of the Caw John boat and he estimated he made 25 trips to the boat ramp um, full of tires. And so 456 tires. And we know this because we had a recycler take them and they counted them for us. Um, so we have another big one scheduled, but um, we do tire cleanups, um, old dump sites. Um, we're doing battery cases up around Manhattan that have been there over 40 years. We're cleaning those up. We, in fact, I was, I was telling Steve, we partnered with the Manhattan Conza Rotary to do that cleanup on the upper end of the river. And so we've been doing that for the last four years. I have a goal when I'm done and I retire, I want all the legacy sites gone. We want the Kansas River to be um, clean, as clean as we can get it. So we're working on that. Just briefly about my advocacy roles, I was appointed by Governor Kelly to chair of the Kansas Water Authority. I was also appointed by Governor Kelly to the Oil and Gas Advisory Committee that works to protect water. Those are both roles in which um, I'm a volunteer appointed by the governor um, to work on water issues across the state. I also am on the Lower Kansas RAP Stakeholder Leadership Team. This is a program with KDHE that works to give landowners cost share money um, to protect water quality through um, conservation programs. I'm also on the Topeka Riverfront Advisory Committee. I mentioned to you all that we had a meeting yesterday to talk about that. And also the Sustainable Rivers Program, which is um, working on reoperating the Corps of Engineer dams for um, to change the way that we manage the flows on the Kansas River. So instead of treating it like a faucet, turning it on and off, that maybe we start to uh, manage those in a way that works better for the entire river system. So those are some of the advocacy things that I'm working on. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I could, I could spend four hours just talking about that. So if anyone here has questions about any of those roles, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. So I'm gonna move on though to the Kansas River Water Trail because this really is where it impacts the city of Topeka. So in 2012, the Kansas River was named at Kansas River Water Trail by the National Park Service. There was a celebration with Governor Brownback and the um, Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism. So this elevates the river. What this says is it's very similar to a bike trail. Um, many of you may have been on the Katy Trail in Missouri, it's a bike trail. 
And on that Katy Trail, you stop at different cities. I mean, I've heard of people, I've not been on it, but I've heard people say, well, yeah, we go to a bed and breakfast. We ride our bike on down to the next town. We have dinner. Then we go to the winery and they ride their bike on this really great journey. Well, the Kansas River is the same concept. So we have 19 boat ramps, 10 counties, lots of communities, and look at how many of them are connected to the Kansas River. So it's a public waterway. Let's talk about what that means. So in the state of Kansas, there's only three public rivers in the entire state, the Missouri River, the Arkansas River, and the Kansas River. All other waterways are private, and you cannot be on them unless you have permission from landowners on both sides. Now, the exceptions to that are if the river is surrounded by state, county, or federal land. So the rivers that flow into our federal reservoirs are public waterways for a good portion of the river because it's federal wildlife area. So for example, the Clinton uh, Reservoir, the Walker River comes into it, you have 14 miles of river that you can play on. And because it's dammed, you can paddle against the current. Um, lots of fishermen, of course, or fisher folk are on this river because right now it's crappie season and they're getting lots of crappie. Um, but the same way with the other reservoirs around here, Perry, Tuttle Creek, and Milford, the upper ends are wildlife areas. Now from the outflow down to the Kansas River, those are not, pro those are not public property. But once you hit the Kansas River, it's called between the high water mark, it's public property. So what's the high water mark? So when you look at a river and you see the muddy bank, and then you see the vegetation that goes up, from the vegetation up is private property. You are trespassing if you go up onto the vegetation. But if you stay from the muddy bank down, which includes the sandbars, those are public. Those belong to the people of the state of Kansas. So we have every right to be on a sandbar. You can camp, you can fish, you can pitch a tent, dig a hole in the sand, build a bonfire, stay for the night, most gorgeous sunrise and sunset you've ever seen from the Kansas River. So um, don't go up the banks to get uh, driftwood or firewood because you'd be trespassing, but there's plenty of driftwood as you can imagine on the Kansas River. I've never had to worry about firewood for a fire, but um, there's lots of ways to enjoy uh, being on a sandbar. The only thing that you need really is a fishing license because right now you don't need to make a reservation. You don't have to have a permit. You know, it's kind of like first come first serve. Um, we're trying to get more people to realize what a great um, piece of public space it is. So a little bit about the river. Um, it's home to a wide variety of plants and animals, but it is home to a record 27 nesting pair of bald eagles. Lots of otter and beaver. I see a lot of beaver on the Kansas River, um, which are really healthy for the ecosystem. And otter, they use the dens of beaver uh, to live along the river. So we see a lot of otter tracks as well. So along the river, I mentioned there are 10 counties, many wastewater treatment plants, small farming communities, um, big cities, urban areas. There's hydropower generated at Bowersock touches the lives of more than 40% of the people of Kansas. And here's the big one. It's a drinking water source for over 800,000 Kansans. In a state of 2.9 million people, that's a lot of people getting their drinking water from the Kansas River. This is the Kansas River access map. So how many of you know why Junction City is called Junction City? Know it? Yes, right? It's where two rivers meet. So you have the Republican River, and the Smoky Hill River. They meet in Junction City and form the Kansas River. Now the Republican River extends its tributaries all the way into Colorado and parts of Nebraska. The Smoky Hill goes all the way out to Logan County in Kansas. And um, my son lives in Colby, Kansas and adult son, uh, he and his wife moved out west. And I've been, he's taken me to the Smoky Hill where it starts, where the headwaters are. Tell me about this wide, completely surrounded by grasslands. It's absolutely beautiful to watch. But the Kansas River starts in Junction City, flows 173 miles where it meets the Kansas or the Missouri River at Caw Point, 19 boat ramps along the way, and all these different ways to engage the community. 
This is the Kansas River watershed. Most people don't know this, but if you've been in Lyman, Colorado, you were in the Kansas River watershed. That's the furthest point west. So when it rains in Lyman, Colorado, the water drains and comes through Topeka. If it's not used or diverted for some other purpose, it'll flow right past your city. Same way with central Nebraska. Um, we often say, you know, political boundaries should follow watersheds uh, because this whole entire area here impacts your drinking water supply right here in Topeka. So the Kansas River Water Trail, a few updates. These are things that are happening um, up and down the whole entire river trail. So you all know probably about the Topeka Weir Project. Phase one was complete. Phase two is still uh, set to begin in September. So the second phase is not done yet, but the first phase is, which is going to provide a safer passage through uh, this part of Topeka and the Kansas River. Uh, we are working on a pilot test to do kayak storage lockers at Lawrence. We hope to have these as part of the Topeka Riverfront design too. So what's a kayak storage locker? It's a storage locker. There's six of them. We've got a design done by a local architect. And so when you get to downtown Topeka and you want to go to Noto or over to downtown, you have a, a kayak locker and you could put a canoe or a kayak, it's on rollers and you roll it in, it can be up to I think 18 feet long and you leave all your gear in it. It's just like locking up your bike. But you're gonna close the door and put your own lock on it, go to Noto, go have a good time and then you can get back on the river when you're done and keep going on your journey. This is important and it's important to river users. I don't know if you've all seen, but kayak sales are through the roof. They're on back order. You can't get one right now. And the little town of St. George, anyone been to St. George on the river? It's darling, but they have a little uh, bar and grill there. They have a restroom. They have a, a little picnic area. That is the primo spot for river users because they can, you, number one, there's a restroom. That's highly important. But number two, they can walk and go get something to eat and get right back on the river. It's a great place to stop. What we wanna do is create these ways for people to do that in all these other cities, especially our big cities. There's no reason why Topeka and Lawrence can't have, and Manhattan for that matter, you know, kayak storage lockers where people get off the river trail and they come into their community and then connect back with the river. We're also working on life jacket stations, friends of the car, everything we do required to wear a life jacket at all times. And we advocate for that. We believe that we should model the behavior that we want to see on the Kansas River. And we want to see people wear life jackets, but you know, wildlife and parks would tell you they should wear them on the lake too. So it's the same concept. We model the behavior we wanna see. So we're gonna have life jacket stations at all the boat ramps where people can just borrow a life jacket, put it back when you're done. Um, we're also working on some Coast Guard signage that will help the 911 system. We've been frustrated that when you call 911 and you give them your river mile that there's a disconnect um, between that. So we're hoping to come up with, we have a new system that we think will work um, with the Coast Guard numbering for the Kansas River. Um, there's some other cities that I thought I'd share with you what they have going on. Kansas City, if you've not heard this, they've got a bridge that goes over the Kansas River, connects KCMO, KCK. They're turning it into a venue space. It's called the Rock Island Bridge Project. Google it if you want to read up more about it. Rock Island Bridge Project. It's an old bridge. They're going to bump it out on both sides, turn it into a venue space, but it's still a pedestrian path. And so people can uh, still ride their bike or walk across the river. Um, we're having an event um, in June, the second weekend in June, both the mayors of KCK and KCMO are gonna join us on the river to uh, show people about the opportunities. And a lot of the community there, they're wanting to develop what they call the call mile. So from this bridge down to where it meets the Missouri River, they wanna call this the call mile. It's the first mile of the river and they want to develop um, on the other side of the levees. So there's lots of activity happening there. DeSoto and Eudora both are working on small projects to connect their communities. Lawrence has a pretty big project that's been started. It's you know got lots of phases to it, so it'll take some time to get done, but 
They're ultimately looking at some play features below the river with fishing pools and kayaking, more access points. We're gonna try and put those kayak walkers in there with them later this year. Um, and they're trying to add more access and connection to their downtown. And then of course, you know about Topeka and we'll talk about that more a little bit here, but Manhattan also has some um, early plans and ideas about how they'd like to connect to the river. So how many of you have been down to the Topeka Weir since it's been finished, a few of you? It's gorgeous, isn't it? Very pretty. So this is a photo that um, I wanted to share with you of it. Phase one on the south side, um, I'm sorry, that should say phase one on the north side is um, complete and the south side is not yet done. So the north side of the river is where this photo is. So there's a walking path, there's rocks. Um, it's very beautiful. The parking lot's been redone. The second phase will start in September. The second phase is that washing machine effect on the far side where the three people uh, passed away on the Kansas River. So that is being retrofitted so that that washing machine effect is being taken out. And so that part of the project is not yet done, but um, it is supposed to start in September of this year. So we're really excited about this. Here's another photo of it. So what they did is here um, closest to you, it looks like a little passageway. They took out uh, the cells of the weir and basically created what they call a chute, but it's also a fish ladder, it's fish access. So kayakers and boaters can go downstream and fish can go upstream. And before this, fish could not go upstream. And so this reopens the river for aquatic life and reopens it for us to be able to get through this area without portaging around it. And of course, without anyone going anywhere close to the other side of the river. So this is a really wonderful project. We were we, uh, Friends of the Caw has advocated for it for a very long time, but we were really thrilled when um, Topeka was able to um, put everything together all at the same time to get this project done. So here's the uh, ribbon cutting. This was on May the 7th. Um, uh, Councilwoman Hiller cut the ribbon for the weir and um, some pictures on the left just kind of show the walkway through there. If you've not been down there, I encourage you to take a drive. It's really pretty, it's very well done. It's gonna be a really nice amenity. But I'll tell you this here is the reason why no one has been on the river through downtown Topeka. This is, this is the catalyst that starts the rest of it. This had to happen in order for us to use the rest of the river trail. Because what happened is, is everyone would get to call River State Park and they'd have a car meet them and they'd hoof it in the car all the way to Seward and then put back in the river and just skip downtown Topeka because they were afraid of this, right? And rightfully so. So this adds a whole new dimension to the downtown development. Um, if you're wanting to do some cool features along the river in downtown Topeka, this now allows easier passage for people that are using the river. So think about some things like this. Um, imagine some activities where you put in at Call River State Park or at the Weir and people get out in downtown Topeka and then they get to enjoy Noto, they get to enjoy the downtown. Um, I've been amazed at how many new restaurants and places of business that there are in downtown Topeka. So it'll be a really great opportunity to find that river engagement. So this is our group. Well, before I, before I go on to that, let me back up a little bit because I did wanna say a few things about the Riverfront Authority. So there's the Topeka Riverfront Authority and then there's the Topeka Riverfront Advisory Council. And I'm on that one. And so what we've, we've got a, a really good group of people. I feel like we have the right people around the table um, to try and work on some of these river issues. And so um, there's a couple different things. And I know, sir, you have worked um, very hard on the downtown master plan. And if you haven't seen the downtown master plan, it's gorgeous. Lots of cool green space and connection to the river. Um, we're interested also in seeing what happens on the north side. There's a lot of space between the levee and the river. And what we have learned is that um, there's what's called the toe of the levee. 
and you have to be so many feet off the toe and then you can do what you wanna do, right? So we found out from the levy districts that you just have these certain criteria. So there's a lot of space in there that something cool could be done. This design that's here at the Topeka Weir, there's no reason why you couldn't do that in downtown and have that as some type of walkway or some sort of cool connector. Um, trails, um, they're the Riverfront um, Advisory Group. There's a group of people that are working to find trail connectors so that people can um, live, work, and play along the river and in the downtown area. So there's a lot of really cool things happening. Our committee is um, moving forward, working on, um, I think the next step is completing an updated plan for the riverfront. So I think that there's some movement to start that. But in the meantime, the rest of us, um, I'm on the Education and Environment Committee. We're working on some activities. There's gonna be a Topeka Capital Paddle. I believe it's gonna be the first weekend in September. Uh, whatever that Saturday is of Labor Day weekend. So there's going to be a coordinated effort to have a big paddle through downtown Topeka. This is our group that took the big, huge trip. And I show this to you just so you can see what fun we're having out on the Kansas River and enjoying it. And um, we have over 300 volunteers um, on our volunteer list that help us with everything that we do. So, um, and then of course we engage the public and try to get more folks involved in helping us clean up the river. But um, there's only me full-time and a part-time program manager. So how do you think I get it all done? 300 volunteers, that's how we get it all done. So um, Friends of the Call was founded um, with volunteers and that remains um, a big part of how we get so much done for the Kansas River. So how can you get involved? If you're interested, you can join us for a paddle trip, an educational trip on the river. If you're interested, reach out and let me know. We do have our calendar on our website, but if you really wanna go, call me, I'll hook you up. We'll get you a kayak, get you out there. There are also about 11 businesses on the Kansas River that do guided trips or that rent um, canoes or kayaks. There's a couple of them here in Topeka. On our website, which is kansasriver.org, you can find a list of all of those businesses. So um, two in Topeka, there's um, a canoe rental company, and then of course the Dirty Girl Adventure Group in Noto. So you've got two options here, and then there's a few more up and down the river as well. But um, however you can connect to the Kansas River, let us know if we can help you. You can also join us as a volunteer. Um, our call river guides, our bank cleanups, our river bank restorations, and our kids about water program, those all run with lots of volunteers. And lastly here, we have membership. If you'd like to be a membership member and support our work, I encourage you to do so. You can find out more on our website. But before I go, I'm gonna mention Beers of the Call, November 7th, this is our biggest fundraiser of the year but it's a beer tasting of all the breweries in the Kansas River watershed. And I think when we had it in 2019, because 2020, because COVID, we had to cancel it. But in 2019, we had every brewery in Topeka at the, the beers of the call. So it's kind of ingenious, but, and I didn't come up with it, but we use the Kansas River watershed map that I showed you. We put it on an easel, like a really, really big easel and we pinpoint all the breweries and we use the beer to teach people about the watershed. And it's pretty cool, yeah. Who doesn't wanna, you know, taste test beer and learn about water? This is our staff. And so uh, me and then our um, program manager, Kim, and our part-time education coordinator, Denise. This is our website, kansasriver.org. And I wanna make sure I leave you with my email address and uh, contact information. Feel free to contact me. I did bring my business cards if anyone would like to grab one on the way out, but um, we're here to help you um, connect to the Kansas River and discover it. So if there's anything that we can do, be sure and let us know. If you're already an experienced kayaker and you just wanna learn more about a different section of the river, give me a call, I'll help you figure it out. I'd be happy to. So with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Well, there are still individual tires. That still happens, I think, because people don't want to, you know, dispose of them or pay to dispose of them. But these particular tires, remember that back in about the 60s, 
tires were used um, as bank stabilizer because we thought they stabilized banks, which they don't. What stabilizes banks are deep rooted grasses and trees. But these tires were in a bank and I remember it when I was a kid, um, them being there and in 93, they blew out. And when they blew out, they embedded into a sandbar. So our volunteers, they took shovels and unearthed 456 tires that were buried in the sandbar. I mean, they were digging in the sand. It, it took us two days to unbury them all. And then one afternoon, and we had lots of partners. So like the Evergy Green Team um, helped us get them all up the boat ramp. And then we had lots of volunteers that helped us get them off the river. But yeah, most of them are legacy sites. So that one is still in flux. There was, um, it was started, they started it. Wildlife and Parks um, had everything ready to go, but there was, I believe, a disagreement with the levy district over whether or not people could go over the levy. And so the way I understand it is that it's still not been completely resolved. So it's still in flux. There's several ways that you could help. One is to clean up trash. And in fact, Steve and I were talking about where are all the places. There are lots of places where trash can be picked up. Another thing is to um, work with, um, to remove honeysuckle along our rivers and plant native trees and native plants because that honeysuckle, it doesn't stabilize the bank. Um, it doesn't hold the soil in place. It's not good for wildlife. So there's lots of opportunities with that, like with the um, Shawnee County um, um, Extension Office or some of our restoration projects, you could do that. There might be some opportunities here on this space to do some sort of native plantings, but um, those are great opportunities. You could also um, come and help with some of our programming. If you're interested in being on the river, there's lots to do, um, lots of cleanups, yeah. So um, when local groups adopt the local boat ramp, so um, we put a sign up, basically says adopt a boat ramp in the name of your group, but you're responsible for uh, doing a trash cleanup once a quarter and for letting us know if there's any like really big issues at the ramp, like maybe um, you found a sofa and we'd wanna work with the local community to get the sofa removed. So in this case for um, Seward Ramp, Shawnee County, um, we've had really good luck working with them. And I think they're actually trying to get some lighting out there and some different things like that. So you'd clean it up once a quarter and then work with both Shawnee County and Friends of the Caw if anything else needed to be done. Basically, we're asking for another set of eyes at the boat ramp to help us make sure that we keep them clean. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You mean the one that they just did? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, we went through the new shoot um, about a month ago, right after it got completed, Braxton Copley, we talked to him about it and he said, it's done, you can go try it. And so we went through it. It was about, the river was about 7,000 CFS and there were little, yeah, yeah, it was fun. And so here's what we did. We got to the end and there's a boat ramp, right? So we got out. And I took my kayak, I have a rope on the front and I walked it all the way back up and I did it again. So yes, yes, yeah, it's, yeah. On the other side, I'm not sure like safety wise where that's gonna wind up. You know, they've said that they're taking out that washing machine effect, but it's still a water intake. And so the river, the water's being pushed over that direction. I'm not sure if they're gonna want anyone on that side. I think that's why everything's designed for the north side. Yeah, but it's pretty cool.
No, and we're hoping they don't. So Wildlife and Parks actually has a program right now, um, aquatic nuisance species specialist that they have. They have a person, his name's Chris Steffen, that that's all he does is work on this kind of stuff. He's got a project that's actually out for bid. And I think the way it's gonna work is they're gonna use acoustics. Um, so when the river's at a certain level, they'll turn these things on and apparently it'll keep them from coming in. It'll keep the, the fish from going up over the dam. So they haven't yet gone over the dam. So, hmm? what's that? Oh, would they be a hazard for boaters? So they're a hazard, yes. Um, but the biggest hazard is, to be honest with you, is that they'll hit you in the face. And, and that's happened to me several times. I mean, what happens is, is that's that noise. So if you're paddling really fast and you hit shallow water, they'll start jumping over your boat like this and you know they'll hit you. Now, if you're in a motorized boat, they hear that motor and they'll start doing the same thing and you'll get them into your boat. So right now they're from Bowersock, you know, down to Kansas City. They've not made it up this way and we really hope they never do. So, but Wildlife and Parks right now has a program that we're really hopeful will help with that. And so um, cross our fingers because in 2019, we, we watched them. Like we could stand on the levee at Lawrence when the flood was at 100,000 CFS and we could see them trying to jump up. And it was like, no, <laughs> because that could just be so bad for the rest of our rivers upstream. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Don, it's our practice to donate a book to Ross Elementary School in your honor, and we have a little deal for you to sign to commemorate your presentation. So thanks again, great presentation. Uh, I forgot to mention cup money. So if you can, if you haven't already, please put a little bit in the cup so we can rebuild that fund and get it going again in the upcoming Rotary year. Uh, next week, our president, speaking of the foundation, Next week, our presentation will be by our local foundation and some of the, the grant, they had the mini grants uh, earlier this year and some of the mini grant recipients will be here to accept their checks and tell us a little bit about their projects. So with that, can we stand and we'll do the four-way test? Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And will it be fun and con? That's all for Joni. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah. 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 Yeah.